Let's start with, um, we welcome you. We thank all of the panelists who are here this morning um, to share their experience, their understanding and their learnings from this online experience. As most of you know, we have been in a COVID-19 situation since, um, since uh, really the beginning of the year around the March timeframe, uh, schools shut down and then they reopened online in the April timeframe. Um, for most of the uh, for most of the counties, and um, so kids were kind of and teachers were kind of hijacked into another uh, a learning situation that um, they they had to quickly prepare for, um, and I'm sure they they learned quite a few things um, as a result of that. And through the summer as well, we returned online. Uh, Governor Hogan um, last month or a couple of weeks ago announced that schools can reopen, but schools are going to look at that, each county is going to look at that from a safety perspective and um, will begin to open up buildings slowly, but, but surely. But in the meanwhile, people do continue on online, the students and, and the teachers. So again, we are glad to have you with us. And um, we, did, we did receive questions from the community um, regarding online learning and um, an online school. So with that, we'll get into um, some introductions. Um, we have with us um, Mrs. Sherry Bisley, principal of 4C Christian School, Silver Spring, Maryland. We have also Mr. Sterling Burke, Jr., teacher, and, uh, teacher of business and computer science, Wild Lake High School, Columbia, Maryland. We have Ms. Samantha Filipiak, um, English teacher, Hammond High School, Columbia, Maryland. Miss Amy Holly, math teacher, Hammond High School, Columbia, Maryland. Um, I'm not sure if Miss Tamika Lewis was able to join, but uh, hopefully she was. Uh, special education assistant, Centerville Elementary School, Centerville, Maryland. We also have Miss Morgan Nixon, math specialist, education teacher, Reach Partnership High School, Baltimore, Maryland. And we also have Miss Janae White, licensed master social worker, the Children's Guild, and she serves in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. So welcome to each of you. When we give you your questions to answer, of course, we'll, we'll announce your name so we can see on the video and on the taping who you are. Um, Pastor Allen, would you like to open us in prayer, please? Uh, that'd be great. Thank you all for coming. Like Pam said, look forward to, to hearing what you all have to say. I think even though we don't have major participation today, this is not um, something that's is worthwhile and it is um, something that we could use as a tool for you and we'll give you the recording so that you can have it. And then that way um, you can use parts of it or whatever if you'd like to edit it for your own particular institution where you teach and um, uh, work. I just want to say thank you for teachers. At <clears throat> one time I thought I was going to be one and I am kind of, you know, being a pastor. So um, I love teaching. I love learning. I, I have tons of books. The congregation gives me a fit sometimes because I have so many books wanting to know if I read all of the books. So as a pastor, you know, some books you don't read, but I would say a majority of the ones that are on my bookcase are, are read by me. <laughs> So we'll begin with prayer and thank you again for everyone for coming. Father, we thank you so much for these folks who are um, educating our young folks. Uh, we are thankful for them, Lord, and the daily struggles that they go through, family and uh, community life and school life and church life, Lord. We just ask that you would continue to strengthen them and give them your peace, no matter how the situation goes. Lord, but um, to know that you are in charge and that uh, that you will, you will walk beside them. Lord, we're ever grateful for teachers, and, um, and I thank you for them. It is a wonderful profession, and they work long and hard hours. It is, sometimes it is a thankless job, but we thank you for them. And we ask today as we go through this forum, as we answer the questions, that it would be for our good, for the community's good and for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. All right, so um, we're gonna start with the first question. Pastor, I think you have that one for us. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, this is for Sherry Bisley, or Principal Bisley. Um, 
it's in the how to uh, process type questions. If you know that in your categories, that's the way our agenda will go today. Um, do you have any suggestions or recommendations on how I could set up my daughter's uh, or son's online learning space to maximize learning? Yes, um, I think it's really, really smart to have a, a quiet space for the, your, their son or daughter, their child. Uh, a desk is really important. Um, and I think it's important to just minimize distractions, obviously. Um, even as an adult, I get distracted, you know, just sitting in my space with all the windows and things on the computer. So uh, a quiet spot, a desk is really important. And just as it's important for us to have the right posture while we're sitting at um, when we're working on the computer with the mouse, the child needs the same. Um, and uh, just a, a really good setup for them so that they're sitting properly the right chair. I think sitting on the bed with your laptop all scrunched up is, is just not advisable. Um, and then you get sleepy. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I think that's really important for them. And um, I just, uh, I think that check-ins with, as a parent, uh, I know the students that are at home, the caregiver or the parent, someone's at home with them. Just frequent check-ins. I think it's um, unrealistic to think that you can set your child up uh, for two hours and then not come back and check in on them. So I just think really uh, frequent check-ins, how's it going, you know, maybe 20 minutes or whatever. Um, and then taking breaks. Um, and I'm sure the teachers are doing this as well. I know a lot of teachers are in the forum today. I'm sure they're encouraging the brain breaks and getting them to stand up and move their arms and legs and um, jumping jacks or whatever it is. But um, I think all of that um, is important. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Anyone else like to add to that or have some, another comment? All right, uh, Pam. Okay. Um, Tamika, welcome. We do have Tamika Lewis with us, and she is, as I mentioned before, she is a um, assistant teacher. Um, how you doing? I'm assistant teacher with Centerville Elementary School. Welcome, welcome, Tamika. And actually, we wanted to you. ask you a question because we know you're working with younger students. Um, we have a lot of representation at the high school level, but we also, um, with Principal Bisley, and you, you're also working with younger younger students. So. Um, with younger children and families that may not be techy, tech savvy or technological, uh, technologically supported, um, how have you as teachers overcome technical learning curves or technical issues so that your students stay online and keep up with the material? Do you have any suggestions, especially with younger students? Well, one of the things that they did do is the way they set the, the, our schedules up. So the teachers have time in the afternoon. Um, they have about two and a half hours to um, talk to any parents that are having issues. Mm -hmm. um, the school itself, also the PTA set up a thing for parents to get some extra help. They um, set up like a forum for them to send in questions to or to actually come online for a uh, Google Meet and pose any of their questions and get some walkthrough instructions right there, like right on the screen. They were going to do some things with them to help them um, to learn to navigate the pro the um, the form that they're using to do the the work. They're using Schoology, and that was new. That's not what they did when we finished school in March, and so they had to teach the teachers, and then they got the teachers and the PTA to help to teach the parents. So they kept things open in the afternoon to help teach the parents what to do. And they've also given them a little bit of grace with when the work is due. So they have up until Sunday to turn in the work, just in case they do have technical difficulties, just in case they don't have anybody there to help them at the time that the teacher is assigning the work. Mm -hmm. So if the child has to go back and do it, um, with an adult that they can go back. They have the time to go back and do it with an adult. You mentioned that the um, PTA and, and what have you have been sponsoring supportive things for the parents to engage the parents in making sure that they understand the technology. Yeah. Um, um, how has the parent response been to that to, as far as you can see? They just did one this week and I'm not sure how many parents they had show, how many parents they actually had show up. I know the teacher that I work with personally I know she has um, personally worked with parents and talked to them and walked them through some things. 
um, probably almost every day <laughs> okay. since we started oh, because wow. it, you know, it, it, it's new for everybody right. and, um, you know, it, it, it's just new and people have had to learn what to do. Right, exactly. Anybody else like to respond to that as far as um, technical challenges you've seen with families and um, how you've been able to support? I, um, from, hi, I'm Sam Flipiak from Hammond High School. Um, I could speak for like the middle school and the high school level. And I know Miss Holly would agree with me. We've talked about this previously. The biggest thing is communication. So if you can't navigate a technology, you aren't sure how to do something, like we, we had talked about like body language is something we feed off with the kids in the classroom. And we can't see that a lot of times when kids have their cameras off and with parents, we don't see them at all. So really just reaching out and letting teachers, administrators, guidance counselors, someone know what's going on. And I would say at least at Hammond, I know like if a parent emailed me and was like, I need help walking through this, I'd pop on a Google meet with them, walk them straight through it. Um, and we at our school, our media specialists are offering drop-in tech hours um, for parents to join with students or without students so parents can um, learn to navigate the technology. We also have built into the high school and the middle school schedule additional like synchronous time which are like office hours and if parents really need walkthrough help they're welcome to jump in those just send the teacher an email they're really for students but if a parent needs something and we're there we're offering it we're happy to walk them through it. Um, we also do have, um, we do a lot of like screencasting. So we take videos of us walking through procedures um, and have a lot of times we share those with students and that can be a resource that parents can use as well. But if I can just stress anything, it's communication, like letting the school know that you need something and you don't know how to do something and we 100% will jump on and help you navigate that. Okay, Amy, great. Okay, um, we'll, in the interest of time, we'll move on, but um, thank you so much for those responses. Seems like parents and students are getting ample support from a technology perspective. And at the end of the session here, I've got some additional information, at least from Howard County Schools, uh, relative to laptop acquisition, as well as getting internet access. So we'll move on. Pastor, I'll let you ask the next question. All right. Now, these are um, for f folks who are special ed students or learning disabilities. This uh, ask uh, Morgan. Regarding special education students, any tips on how to keep my special uh, ed child engaged and successful during this time of 100% online learning? Uh, what can we do to support her? And should the child's IEP for special ed be updated due to online learning? Okay, so um, I'll start with the first question. I also want to say um, I was, I'm not a math specialist. <laughs> um, I'm a math special education teacher. Um, I do work with math teachers, though, who are specialists, so they are very um, smart. And I will start with, so keeping the child informed and engaged in learning, I would have a consistent schedule with them. Um, a lot of children who are on the spectrum for autism, um, consistency is key. Um, I might have like a picture schedule next to their laptop just so they can see, okay, I have to go to this class, I have to go to this class, okay, I need a brain break here. Um, I teach self-contained math special ed, so I have to give them brain breaks because it's in their IEP every um, five to seven minutes. So, um, but I know a lot of you guys teach general ed kids, so I guess having giving them a brain break after their class is best. Um, I also, it's important that they check for daily assignments on Google Classroom every day and that they check their grade once a week and that they have questions that we have something called coach class. Um, it's an after school math enrichment program for students who are struggling in math. So I tell them to come to coach class if they don't like their grade and I'll bump it up to an 80% if they understand the material. Um, on that assignment and uh, they can show me that they understand it. So what can we do to support the, ch the child, give them screen breaks, have a lot of time for homework? Um, what else? At, so I, I teach special ed, so a lot of these children need extended time. So I, I give them extensions on almost all their assignments. If they can't get it in on time, we have to give them grace for that. Um, so that's just something on the special ed end. 
So should the IEP be updated due to online learning? Um, I know in Baltimore, I teach in Baltimore City Public Schools. It was required that they all were amended um, prior to the school year. So they have to include um, supplementary services and, and accommodations that are um, on, for the online forum, uh, which should be included in the renewal. So if a child has a renewal for their IEP coming up, then online learning supports will be included. So I know some students don't have a renewal coming up, so theirs was just amended, so it's fine. Um, and I think I answered all the questions. Okay. Um, does anyone have any further comments or questions for Morgan or anything to add? Okay, all right, thank you, Morgan. It sounds like um, we're definitely holding our special ed students close making sure that they're going to um, be successful moving forward. Um, uh, um, Amy, we wanted to ask you this question, and, um, and again, everybody else can weigh in as well. Um, if you have an ADHD child, so it's, um, it's a slightly different bent on things. Um, ADHD, I have ADHD folks in my family, and I know that it's not a matter of intelligence. It's a way of looking at their work and um, a way of approaching their work that can be very different than the traditional classroom um, approach. So any tips on how to keep my ADHD child engaged, focused, and successful with online school? What can we do to support him or her? Should my ADHD child's 504 be updated due to online learning? Any, questions, any answers on that, Amy, you would like to share? Um. So I'm not a special education teacher, and I would always say talk to the case manager. It's such a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but use to your advantage that teachers are problem solvers. We want your student to have access to all of these things and be able to engage. And just like Sam was saying, like it is about that communication. Um, I just had those conversations with my students of like, your teachers kind of seem to read your mind sometimes it's because we're reading your body language and we're just not afforded that opportunity you don't have your camera on and things. Um, so really, I, I always like to breach things as opportunities. And, and it, it really is, it's an opportunity for students to learn how to advocate for themselves and really kind of find out what they need on their own, um, which I think will be really successful and helpful for them later in life. Um, but it's, it's so much about communicating um, and reaching out to your guidance counselors. I know at Hammond, we have a student uh, community Canvas course, and that's where students can message their guidance counselors and their admins still and all of those kind of things if they're having trouble with the organization. Um, I know that I have set up some different Google Docs um, where they can copy them for the week or for the whole semester and write their homework and things like that in there. And it's really about spending that time setting up their own organization. And maybe it's just a matter of on their phone and having little 15 minute, you know, reminders pop up. Um, the other big thing that keeps coming up is in the middle of class, like, oh, I have to go get my breakfast. And it's like, okay, well, we got to get into a routine. We're starting school an hour and a half later than we normally do. You know, we got to get into a routine where you wake up earlier. You're not rolling out of bed and hopping into a Google Meet. You're waking up and you're getting yourself set and you're, you have a space that's different than just sitting in your bed, like a lot of other people were, were saying. But it's so individualized and that's one of the fun parts of teaching, right, is that problem solving. So really like having those conversations is gonna be the biggest thing. I'll Sorry. just add there that at, at Forsey Christian School, we're doing the, uh, and someone else on the panel mentioned it as well, sort of an advisory block. And each student is assigned to an advisor, <clears throat> a staff member, um, <clears throat> and they do individual uh, check-ins each week, addressing some of these uh, concerns that Amy was just mentioning. Are you getting up? What's your schedule like each day? And um, let's look at it. Let's look at your schedule. And, and what time are you getting up? And um, and then they, they have access to their all their uh, classes. So I see you are you know, behind in your math homework, you know, and so just one on one accountability. It's just really accountability. And because um, as Amy said, we want all the, the kids to be successful. All the teachers do. And so uh, I think those just those one on one sessions and accountability that advisory block is really important. 
And we're also doing these um, open link. I think someone else mentioned that. Um, just, I'm on, uh, my link is open on at Fridays from 11 to one or whatever it is. And kids can hop in and hop off um, and ask and have access to the teacher, so. Gotcha. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, any other um, questions for um, Amy or Morgan regarding, or Principal Bisley regarding, or any other additional thoughts regarding handling our special ed students and our ADHD uh, students? May I ask a question? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have an ADHD student and I actually work during the school day. So um, with an ADHD student, one of the things that's in there, well, when they're in session, uh, in all of their 504 plans is that they have what is reminder prompts while they're in class. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when the parent is, at, is not in, there's no one here for those reminder prompts. Um, what is something that we can ask? What is something that can be done to assist our students in that? Like, I'm not here during the day to give my student reminder prompts to, to stay on task and to, so what happens is on Saturday and Sunday, I'm here doing with him doing those assignments that he got for the whole week, you know? Because, you know, he's shy, he doesn't talk during, you know, he's an introvert and he has ADHD. So he has focus issues and he's an introvert. So he's not asking questions. So I'm pretty much, I'm not there. So I don't know exactly what the assignment entails. Um, he's not really focused <laughs> while he's in the class. Um, yeah. Um, I can answer some of your question, uh, Ms. Jamia. So, um, I do have some students in my classes that have ADHD and uh, something you can do, the teacher can do is use the private chat and just message the student saying, hey, I see you're getting a little distracted. Um, please pay attention to the lesson. Do you have any questions? Um, I co-teach in an Algebra 1 class and one of the students I work with, um, he has like a, like a form of ADHD, so I usually have to go into a breakout room with him and just get him on task to do his work. And we, and I complete, I help him complete the assignment so we can turn it in on Google Classroom. Um, if, if your child has a co-teacher in the class that is a special ed teacher, um, even if they have a 504 plan and not, not an IEP, the 504 plan is still underneath the um, supervision of the special educator. So they can go into a breakout room um, with him or her and Get them back on task and ask them questions and to see if they're staying on task and also emailing the parents or emailing the teacher calling the teacher saying hey um my child needs a bit more support in your class can you make some accommodations for her or him so um and the teachers are here to help so sometimes they're just not as aware as um a parent might think about the situation so yeah i'd also oh, wow. oh. Sorry, I was just going to say we have a we have a question in the chat. Um, a, a definition of a five hundred four plan, if anyone wants to offer that. Um, so so a five hundred four plan is usually for a child who does not have a disability that needs an IEP. So like ADHD, diabetes, um, some forms of epilepsy, they just require five hundred four plans because it's not affecting like their and like or their intellectual ability. So you can have ADHD, but be in AP classes, um, but you, you just need some like task cards. You guys might need some prompts from the teacher to stay on task. You don't need like um, some like serious tiered instruction from in a self-contained classroom. And so 504 plans are milder than IEP. Right, and I, I, so 504 plans are for those students, like you said, that don't have intellectual um, um, disabilities, but they may have focus issues, dis, um, uh, diabetes, things like that. Um, and, and I think you said a gentler form. We also had a question on what an IEP is. Um, so it's just an individualized education plan. Um, there's a lot of documents in it. It's a, so you have supplementary services, accommodations in the plan. You have goals with objectives and state level standards. Um, you also have to put parent contact forms on the plan. You also have to put um, other documents. It's very detailed, but it's for students who need um, some extra support in the classroom. Okay. 
And as you got, um, there's also a question, how do you find out if the child should be on one of these plans, 504 um, or IEP? Okay, so what they have to do is, um, the general ed teacher usually has to do like systematic observations in the classroom. And if they see that the child might be on the spectrum for a disability, um, they'll just maybe start uh, talking to a special ed teacher and they'll start doing more observations and collecting work samples. And if the child is, if the teachers think, you know, the child might be on the spectrum for something, uh, they might have to go to a doctor to, to get an evaluation or a licensed special educator um, in some of these assessments um, will test them formally for a disability. Um, and usually they start with tier one. So in tier one, um, they're in the general ed classroom just doing observations. Tier two, the child might just need some extra math coach classes at the end of the day, or they just might need some extra um, classes uh, maybe after school just to help them maybe in their reading or writing. But tier three, if a child is in tier three and um, none of those things are helping, then they think they might think that they might have um, a disability. So a formal, um, a formal process to start the IEP process might begin, but it has to be with the parent's permission. They can't start that without the parent's permission. So, um, thank you, Morgan, very much. Um, I yes, Amy. Can I just um. In Howard County, we don't have private chat because we use Google Chat. So um, unlike Zoom, where you can chat just like one person, we can't do that. Um, but teachers do like follow up um, after class and send messages. And that's another reason to come to office hours and things like that to get the help and support. So just be aware, like each county might be um, a little different with things like that. Okay. We have some additional questions on chat for this particular topic area. We're going to try to circle back to that um, as we wrap up. Um, but in the interest of time, um, we, but thank you so much for those questions, Gwen. That helps us to make sure we're defining the acronyms and, um, and things of that nature. We're going to try to circle back to answer some more of those questions toward the end of the session. Um, but with that, Pastor, I'll turn it over to you for the next uh, session. Question. Thank you. So we're, um, this section is about uh, emotional and social support. And um, this is for Samantha. My child's not happy about going back to school online. Any helpful tips and how I can get him or her to see the advantages of online learning and to get excited about it and help manage their time. Okay, so um, the one of the biggest things that we, I know specifically or Hammond are doing is just trying to um, encourage first and foremost that this is a different scenario than we had in the spring. So in the spring we had emergency remote teaching where we were kind of just thrown into the process. We, um, you know, there was a different grading policy. It was pass fail in the fourth quarter. Um, but now we are back to our original grading system. Um, the classes do matter. Um, grading is real. Um, teachers, of course, are building in flexibility to account for any technology issues, adjustment to the online learning world, um, but really selling that message that this is, this is real school. Um, and even with Howard County, we actually transitioned our high school schedule to a semesterized schedule. Um, so we used to have a seven, um, the kids used to take seven classes a year. Now students are taking four classes a semester. So students have four classes from September to the end of January, and then they'll have four at other classes from the end of January to June. And so the grading is changing as well. I know HCPSS just put out their new grading policy, whereas students final grades, like determining if they're passing a class was actually determined by four quarter grades and two exams. And that is changing for this year because we're semesterized where students actually only have two quarters of grades that determine their final um, piece. So just selling that first and foremost, this is real school. Um, and I know as a parent that, you know, and teachers too, we're doing that, but I know something at Hammond that we're going to begin engaging in the next couple of weeks is getting our student leadership to start speaking out to the student community about successful ways to be engaged in online learning, that this is real school, it does really count, um, and really just trying to motivate kids. We also um, have bear time at our school, and most of the Howard County high schools have some sort of flex time on Mondays from looking at my schedule, 10.50 to 11.20, um, like at Wild Lake, uh, it's uh, Wildcat time, correct? Um, and so it's all, it's like our advisory period where 
some schools are doing it differently where I know somebody even mentioned they have um, time to meet with like a specific teacher. Ours is a little bit different at Hammond. That's where we are encouraging students to virtually meet with clubs, organizations, sports. So SGA, getting involved in um, Interact Club, getting involved in your class council, getting involved in math team. Um, so all of those clubs and organizations that we usually have during the regular school year face-to-face, -face, we're still having on Mondays. And other, um, other places, other clubs are meeting um, outside of those times as well. Um, and I know this is something that most parents are torn on and most teachers are torn on, um, but if your student does have social media, getting connected with clubs and organizations on social media, um, that's gonna be a big front. And that could be something as a parent, if you don't allow your child to have social media, which is totally a normal thing, um, you can have it connected on your own personal social media and share those messages with the student. Because I know um, since we're going online, a lot of clubs and organizations and sports are utilizing social media to get messages and connections out to students. Um, and really just trying to get them to socialize. Um, I, I know Miss Holly and I have talked about in our classes, we love to see students' faces. And we, and we know that's not necessarily possible in every home setting. Students might might not feel comfortable. Students might feel like they're on display because right now I can see everybody's background, everybody's faces. Whereas in a normal classroom, we wouldn't traditionally do that. Um, you know, you wouldn't be on a spotlight. So if students are feeling comfortable and taking that chance to turn on their camera, we really highly encourage them to do that. That might help them feel more connected in the classroom, recognize that they're in a class with their peers, um, and just teachers are trying to build activities that are fun and engaging. Um, like I'm playing, I teach yearbook as well at my school. I'm playing games every Friday at the beginning of class to try and build our classroom community and just make this fun for kids. Um, trying to find the balance of this is real school, but we also like have to build our classroom community and make relationships and really connect with kids. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, Pam. Okay. Um, Let's see, Janae, um, Janae White, who's our social worker on the, um, on the panel here. Uh, thank you so much, Janae, for being here. I'm yeah. gonna bring up your, your quick slides that you have. Um, the question that she is addressing is, studies show that increasing numbers of students say they feel overwhelmed. Um, a parent did sit this in based on um, an online um, article that they saw, and not just about the health of their family and friends due to the coronavirus. Um, their parents might have been furloughed, unemployed, um, they might be falling behind academically. They can't see their friends or be involved in extracurricular <laughs> as they used to, or they might even be trapped at home in an abusive family situation. Um, faced with soaring needs, social isolation, and limited options, what are some creative ways counselors, social workers, and teachers have been reaching out to students and to help? And I'll, I'll share my screen. Trying to get that download there. There it is. All right, so go right ahead, Janae. Okay, so I'm just going to start off with just providing just some tips for identifying social supports that parents have access to. So, of course, one of the basic things that they can do is review the school website and explore any socio-emotional um, resources that the school has and familiarizing yourself with the, the social-emotional team of the school. So that's your school social worker, your school, um, your school guidance counselors, your school psychologists. Um, something else you can do is connect with the school's um, guidance counselor, especially if, you're, if your child is new, is an incoming freshman, um, might be just now starting middle school or elementary school. They might, the school really might not have a good um, idea of your child's needs. So starting to build those relationships and um, rapport with the school is important. Um, like many of the other presenters said, most of um, the teachers and um, the guidance counselors, the whole school faculty, they, they have uh, virtual office hours. So utilizing those virtual, out, virtual office hours to talk to the guidance counselors and discuss any concerns with them that your child might be experiencing. Sometimes the guidance counselors also um, have direct communication with teachers, so they'll be able to get some of your answers if your child is having any um, issues in, with teachers teachers or issues in the classroom, they can kind of troubleshoot some of those concerns quicker than you can sometimes. Um, attend a virtual back to school night. Um, the school that I work at, 
recently had a back to school night um, and it actually went a lot smoother um, than I, what I thought it was going to be, but students were able to go into the chat room and talk to different, um, different people in the school, they were able to talk to the principal, um, teacher, so that actually was a great event. Um, explore your child joining a virtual extracurricular activity in, um, in club. So again, like Amy said, that's a great way to start rebuilding those socialization skills um, and students have been really excited about that. Also following your, your school's Instagram or social media account. Um, some school guidance counselors have their own um, social media pages where they post different events that they might be having or even share different activities and mindfulness um, um, development groups and stuff like that that they might have offering at the school. So definitely following the school social media page. Um, look into if your school is offering any school-based mental health services. So I work for an agency called the Children's Guild and um, the Children's Guild has private um, contracts with public schools, charter schools um, in the Baltimore metropolitan uh, area. And what that is, is clinicians are assigned to schools and we provide mental health services to families, um, therapy and psychiatry services. Um, so if there is not a, a school-based clinician in your school, you can always call the back of your insurance card and see what community um, providers are in your network. Um, and many providers are offering teletherapy services right now. Um, a mobile crisis team. So if you feel that your child's mental health needs are a little more uh, pressing and immediate, um, you can contact a mobile crisis team. So um, a mobile crisis team provides immediate response to a mental health crisis. So basically what that is, is a licensed mental health professional can come to your home and evaluate anyone experiencing a psychiatric emergency. So services typically are 24 hours, seven days a week, depending on uh, the county that you live in. Um, and if your child is not necessarily having a psychiatric emergency, but you just need some resources, you just want to talk to someone about maybe substance abuse uh, treatment programs, domestic violence resources, um, you can call into those hotlines. Also, if your child is in need of like an urgent care appointment, and sometimes there's long wait lists, if you call into one of those um, hotlines, they can typically get you an appointment a lot quicker than what you can get on your own. Um, and lastly, these are some of the mobile crisis services that we have in Maryland. So there's Anne Arundel County, there's Howard County, and I can send this to any parent um, if they're looking to have these resources after the presentation. Okay. Um, and Go right ahead, Janae. I'm just, thank yeah, you. Okay. Go right ahead. Um, yeah. And lastly, these are just some basic tips that I recommend and I um, encourage my parents to utilize. Um, so implementing maybe like a five minute guided meditation in the morning, you can use uh, YouTube as your platform. So this allows your, your kids to really set the tone and the posture of the day and alleviate any anxiety that they may be having um, associated with the learning process. Um, my next tip I would say is maintain structure. Um, having your child mimic a traditional school day so being able to take a shower brushing your teeth getting dressed it allows them to have some sense of normalcy and control over their day um, if possible uh, create multiple spaces in the home that your child can work from so the bedroom the kitchen table um, the basement the living room and this just allows them to kind of keep those motors running and being able to work from different places in the home um, and last but not least um, transitions in time co to compress decompress is important. So allow your child to disconnect from virtual learning once they've completed the day. Once upon a time, we were able to go to work and then we get, got in the car and that was our, our moments to decompress for the day. So it's important to model for our children the importance of that time to themselves and decompressing and um, being able to just turn off um, academic needs and allowing them to focus on other areas of their life. So yeah. Thank you, Janae. That is awesome. And guys, the deck will be available as well for anyone who wants to have that information. Thank you so much for that. That was very helpful. Um, Pastor Allen, back to you. Sure. Thank you, Pam. This is for uh, Sterling. Uh, Sterling, we, uh, we want to talk about short-term and long-term effects for students. And uh, I know you've been teaching for quite a while, and so you've seen it before COVID and now after. So we'd like to know uh, what you think about the overall online school remote learning will we'll put on our child significantly um, behind in their curriculum or studies and uh, how those affects, uh, how, how this affects our students in the process. 
So I'm in a unique situation because I teach a course that is a dual enrollment course at HCC. So I don't have the option of falling behind in our curriculum. Uh, we, have a, we have a mandate in Howard County of three to four hours a week uh, in terms of work per class and my kids are doing their four because we have mandates from HCC about how much they have to get done uh, in the business curriculum. And uh, there are times during that synchronous time where we are going over some of the work that they would normally do asynchronously just so we can get through everything. Uh, in terms of the effects, I mean, this is gonna affect everyone just because we're not having human contact, which we are used to. Um, I'm also in a unique position because I'm also a coach. So we are having to deal with the loss of athletics, not only last year, last school year, because I'm a track coach and we literally had two weeks of practice and then our season was canceled. Uh, so all those kids that missed last year, especially the seniors, that was a big thing for them. And then now this year with Hogan coming out and saying, oh, sports should start October 7th, which I'm just like, I don't know about that. Uh, youth sports are going right now. I'm actually coaching my son in youth youth flag football, and that is going reasonably well. They have not had any incidents. We have to do things like take their temperature before the game, and everyone has to wear masks. Um, every kid has to wear gloves on the field, you know, all that kind of stuff. So there's no actual physical contact uh, skin to skin. But um, in terms of the short-term effects, like I said, not having human contact and not having had it for a couple of months now in some people's cases uh, is going to be damaging, but it's not something we can avoid. It is not safe to be in school, uh, especially a high school setting with 1,500 kids and 200 to 300 adults. Uh, my son is in school, but he is at a private elementary school with only 10 kids in his class. And there is only one class per grade and they are self-contained, they are outside a lot, not cooped up indoors. Uh, so it's a very different situation. Uh, but we're talking about public school, Wild Lake is just under 1400 kids. It's just not safe. Um, Long-term, I think we have to accept that things will probably never get back to the way they were. There will always be some restrictions uh, contact wise, having to wear masks, having to stay distant to an extent until there is some kind of cure or vaccine for it. And until they know more about it to where when someone does contract coronavirus, they know how to treat it. So getting mentally prepared that things will probably never be the way they were in 2019, uh, or at least not for the next couple of years when it comes to school and when it comes to outside um, it's just not going to be able to revert back to it safely until we know more about the coronavirus and know how to treat it better when someone contracts it and how to uh, create a vaccine for it. So I guess the long term is to know that it's not just an education, it's everything that things are going to have to change, at least for the next couple of years. The short term, uh, like Samantha was talking about, as teachers, we're just trying to make things as interesting as possible. One of the positives, I guess you could say from this, is that I'm no longer limited by the number of computers I have in my classroom. So my business class is 38, uh, which can be a little bit of a struggle in terms of uh, letting everyone's voice be heard. But my kids have done a good job about using the chat uh, to answer the questions that I'm proposing to them and being able to participate in the discussion that way. Thank you, Sterling. Also, I have a question. This is out of the box. This is a wild card, so this is really going to freak out Pam because it's not on the question. <laughs> uh, my wife said this, you know, a Abigail goes to Forsey, where Miss Vislay is the principal. And so we've noticed this like at Archibald, uh, Archibalding High School over in Severna Park and other places. Some of them have already opened up. So here you are in class for three weeks and then all of a sudden you got one or two kids come with COVID and then the, the whole in-person thing shuts down, you know, and parents are scrambling to get somewhere. I don't know if that's a question, but Trisha was just saying, I'd just rather avoid all that and just keep Abigail at home because then you have to do the back and forth. And I know for parents, some of you have kids too. 
and you work, how, how, how does that, I mean, I don't know if there is a answer or a question, but it's just some of the things that she was bringing to me. Go ahead. So that's been my argument from the beginning. Uh, as I said, my son is at school in person at Anne Arundel Christian School. The upper school just sent out an email on Friday that they had someone test positive and they are now closed for the next two weeks. So when you have a situation where schools have rushed to go back, and like I said, his school, the elementary school level is different than high school. You don't change classes in elementary school. You can be more self-contained. You can stay in your classroom. They eat lunch in the classroom. They don't use the cafeteria anymore. You know, the only time they're even somewhat together is in chapel, they're spaced out, all of that. You can't do that in high school. It is impossible because teachers are specialized. Teachers teach a subject. They don't teach all seven or all eight. So you can't have kids self-contained in a classroom. Even if you have the teachers move, which I've heard someone come up with that idea, then you have a situation where those teachers have still been in a classroom with 30 other kids. So now whatever they have been in contact with, with those 30 kids, they're now bringing into that next group. So it really doesn't change the dynamic. Um, and so when you are saying a school has had to shut down because they went back, that's going to happen because there have also been reports of parents knowingly send their kids to school who are t already tested positive for coronavirus. And I think it was in Wisconsin was the article I read, but I know it's happened in multiple states that opened up that parents had their kids tested, they tested positive, and they still sent them to school anyway. And I always felt like, I know, you know, my dad and I have had this argument about, you know, parents having to work and things like that. But when you take a parent who has set their schedule up a certain way for their kid to be able to go back, and then all of a sudden for two weeks, it is thrown in reverse. High school kids, they can usually be home by themselves. Elementary school kids can't. So if that happens in an elementary school, that completely throws the parent for a loop. So that's why I feel like it's safer until we know more to be virtual uh, when it comes to public school. And I just wanted to add, um, I teach in Baltimore City Public Schools and they did have small uh, class sizes for summer school and it was successful. They're going to, um, they're going to make an announcement October 16th, whether or not they're going to start going to a hybrid model. Most people don't think they are. They, I, I, I'm most, my principal was saying he thinks it's going to be online for the whole school year. And I think that's the gist for most counties, but I'm not sure. Um, but they're honestly just taking it day by day. Um, I know I, I teach at Reach Partnership High School and I just go into the school just to get supplies or if I need to make a lot of copies for something, but um, our school has um, almost 700 kids and a lot of them, you know, have a lot of needs, a lot of, and I know a social worker was just speaking, but a lot of them are on some form of welfare. So that sometimes students have to come by to get food or to get um, clothing or to get, you know, toiletries so um, it's just they have the, and they have temperature checks when they come in. They can't come in like with a whole group of people. It has to be just the student or the student and the parent. So I mean, a lot of regulations are in place, but I don't think, at least in Baltimore City, they're going to reopen it this school year fully. At least. And I wanted to add, our school, we are at our elementary school. We do have kids in our building right now. We have. Um, about about nine kids, but we don't have kids in every class. Our school is pre-K to second grade, and we have a little over 500 students. But they are saying to us that by October, they want us to be at 50% capacity. So um, they are taking, we have been taking precautions. Right now, the kids leave school at noon. And um, we give them breakfast in the morning, we, we do AABB, so, and Wednesday, they're doing asynchronous learning and using that Wednesday to, like, do a deep cleaning of the building, um, but the days that the kids come to school, they're getting breakfast, like, in a plastic, like, a grocery bag, everything's individually wrapped, whatever they're having, they're having, like, the bowl of cereal or a little breakfast cookie or something, and then at lunchtime, we're sending them out with the lunch. We're putting the lunch in their backpack as they leave um, every day. 
So we only had probably about, they started with our kids that had IEPs, our ELL kids and things like that for, for the classroom. But as of Monday, we will have kids in every teacher's classroom and they won't necessarily be the kids with IEPs. They're just starting to get um, the classroom. So some teachers will have as little as three kids in their room and some teachers will have as many as 10 because right now the, the two rooms that I work in, one room had uh, nine and the other room had eight, I think, and we'll be, both of them will be up to 10 or more. I think our, our class, one class will have 11 and the other one will have 10, I think, um, starting on Monday. So, um, I mean, we're, we're wearing masks and we have, you know, hand sanitizer and washing hands and all of those things. Um, and we have been blessed so far that parents have let us know when kids have had fevers and, and things like that. But I, I feel, I believe that as we get more kids in, that's going to change. We're not going to have, all parents are not gonna do that for us. And, you know, and we are not checking temperatures. We're not, we're not taking temperatures. They said it was not required. So we're not taking temperatures. So, you know, the, um, the nurse has a cart. So the kids won't even come to our office. If we feel like someone's sick or something, they've told us, call the nurse, she'll come to them. So. I would also say, and I, I apologize to jump in, but I know with HCPSS, I know, parents have been frustrated about the fact that we have decided to stay online for the first semester. Um, and I, I, she's shaking her head. She's doing it. <laughs> but recognize that in like some people have explained at other schools like Spalding where they went in for two weeks and, and teachers were planning to teach face to face. And then they had to, again, switch to that emergency remote teaching, which is a less meaningful practice. It is not, we're not trained for it. They're just throwing things together on the fly. Whereas I will, I will applaud HCPSS for making this decision and sticking with it. One, from a perspective of safety, which Mr. Burke is stressing, the fact that schools don't have the capacity or the manpower or the resources right now to be able to do daily temperature checks. Um, and so we have been trained. We've been doing extensive professional development, extensive training on how to build meaningful instruction, how to engage students in an online environment, how to have students build community, how to do instructional design pieces to build content in an online model and use our Canvas learning management system. And if like we can do that consistently, it's going to build a more meaningful educational experience for students. That giving the teachers time and consistency, and I will, Miss Holly and I have had these conversations. She's like my buddy at Hammond, so we always talk. Um, but the fact that now we're about to start our fourth week of school, so many teachers are getting into routine. They're establishing procedures. The kids know what to do. And the kids are becoming more successful. Not every student, of course, I'm making a generalized statement that doesn't apply to every student student, especially with our students that are receiving special education services. But being able to have that consistency, even though it may not work for everyone, one, it is a decision made out of safety for students and staff. Um, and two, it lets us build a consistent policy that students can find useful. And again, we'll have that opportunity to reevaluate at the end of the semester, but really just letting kids get into a routine, letting teachers have the time to learn this and not just being able to change on the fly. I mean, teachers are flexible people. We adjust, we make about a thousand decisions a second in the regular classroom. And we're probably making about 5,000 decisions a second in the online room. So recognize like giving the teachers the space to learn how to do this is, is definitely something that I believe HCPSS did right. And the way that it was explained to me at the beginning of us going through our training was that the reason that they set this schedule up semester wise and uh, Samantha and Amy, you can attest to this. Uh, Canvas looked very different in terms of the way the classes were broken up and so did Synergy. Um, where they're broken up into sections, they have already set up our system to be able to go back second semester in a hybrid model because they have our classes set up as A and B. So right now in the virtual world, we are teaching them all at the same time, but they are setting it up so that in the winter in February, we go back in a hybrid model where we see each set of those kids 
uh, twice a week. And the kids that are at home on their hybrid day will go through a virtual classroom with us. And that's what's happening also in my son's classroom where he actually has 16 kids in his class, but six families opted out, which was the option they were given by the school. And so those six kids are basically piped into the classroom all day virtually and the other 10 kids are sitting in the classroom. That's what 4C Christian School is doing as well. So teachers are ready. If we, if we do have to, we're all not back. Our pre-K and kindergarten are back and we're, we're hoping to bring first through third grade back on October 12th. That's the plan. We have a whole plan and we're tracking indicators both internally and, at, and in the community. And so we're currently on track to bring first through third grade back on the 12th. And so teachers are prepared if, if we do have to close um, and to, uh, you know, in case uh, something happens, in case we have a COVID case or a suspected case, the teachers are already teaching remotely. Um, some op parents are opting in to stay home anyway, even if we open, so. Hey guys, in, in the interest of time, um, we actually have, we had a few more questions, but you guys actually addressed it as you, you were just so wonderful with your responses. We had questions regarding how you're handling grading and appointments, um, how you're engaging parents, um, special accommodations that you're making for grading and how you're communicating that with parents. You guys actually got into those answers for us today and how you're making yourself available to students and to parents. So um, those were the final questions that we have. Um, the, only, the only other thing that I wanted to show on screen was um, some information resources that um, we can take, that our students can take advantage of. And um, at least from a Howard County perspective, but I know the other counties have the same type of information. So as we wrap up, um, just real quick, are there any additional resources um, that you would point parents or students to? Howard County, I got you covered because I'm getting ready to show it on screen in a minute. But um, uh, for the other counties in particular, are there any other, um, and also we have Janae's slide deck, which will also be um, attached to the, um, to the final um, um, postings. But are there any other additional links, resources? Amy? I also, not necessarily a link or a resource, but, but blue light filters. Um, if you don't know about them, people have blue light filter glasses. There's a Chrome extension called Screen Shader that's free and incredible. And the, the blue light that comes out of your screens mimics the sun and it makes you stay active and awake. It's what gives people headaches and things like that. Um, I would really, really encourage you, um, the Screen Shader one I personally really like because it goes up and down with the sun. Um, I always encourage students to make sure they have that on their phones. If you have a kid who's up on their phone all night and can't fall asleep because of the blue light um, and you'd be amazed turning a blue light filter on they can play on their phone and fall asleep instead um, it's really nice um, there's also a random book um, that's a free kindle download that i found years and years ago um, that has some really nice resources for, and it's written for high school students um, but i think middle school students could probably get a lot out of it it's called caffeine will not help you pass that test um, and it just kind of helps kids kind of reflect where they spend their time and has some different structures in it to help. Um, just, I know it always helps to have something tangible, um, but blue light filters and meditation apps, the Calm app is great. Um, getting into that routine of sleep is something we deal with with students, whether they're in like the physical school building or not, and just that routine, 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 uh, like Miss White was talking about, it's just so important. And you said that it was called Screen Shader, if that's the name yeah, of it? Yeah, that's the one that I found. There's a ton of them out there. If you just search blue light filter, um, I have one on my personal computer called Flux, um, which is a program I downloaded, but for Chromebooks and things, um, you can get a Chrome extension. Um, and you can, you know, turn it off when you need to and different things. But I know I've had some students tell me they're getting headaches and things like that. I had a headache really bad the other day and I can't get any work done. It's all on my computer. Right, so it's it's just very helpful. I, I need that just just period. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> they even will put it in your glasses now. You can buy glasses that are just yeah. blue blue light filters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I just want to say for Baltimore City, 
I know a lot of these kids have a lot of needs, um, especially a lot of them are, might be on welfare. So I always point them to the social worker if they're ha if they have food insecurity, if they need clothes, if they need lotion, deodorant. Um, and yeah, I, I most most students and actually I had a social worker come into my class a couple of times this week to talk to students in breakout rooms who might be um, food insecure. So I, I usually point them to the social worker first um, for those needs. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Amy. Anyone else? Oh, a lot of um, like a lot of companies are doing free online resources right now because of COVID. Um, at least they started that in the spring, and, I, and I've seen that continue. So um, parents can do that. PBS and Brain Pop is another one. They have a free application, and then, then there's a paid application as well. But um, Khan Academy is another K H A N is another really good resource, and that's all free. So there are really good free resources um, parents can find online. And then I know there's a lot of support groups in Facebook just for parents to talk and, you know, give each other ideas and help each other. Um, so those kinds of things might be helpful as well. Awesome. awesome. I might also check out um, any public library resources. I know Howard County Public Library. I live in Baltimore County, so Baltimore County Public Library as well. Um, they, they have a ton of free resources. I know Howard County. County Public Library offers homework help 24 seven, like with a live chat with a representative to help students through homework and it's completely free. If you're a Howard County student, you automatically have a library card built into um, our, 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 they call it our splash pad for HCPSS, it's hcpss.me. And that's where the students log into Canvas or Synergy. But if they scroll to the bottom, there's also a link to the Howard County Public Library, which will automatically log them in. They can rent, um, do homework help, they can rent, um, you know, electronic resources, they can actually pick up books from the library now. Um, so that is a free resource and it's super helpful. I know at the Savage Branch Library, the, the librarians there are super willing to connect with resources, talk to things. They're amazing. Miss Holly is showing us like they are fantastic. They have a great relationship I know with Hammond High School in particular, and I think Patuxent Valley as well. Um, but any of um, students that live in the Savage area would be a great place to connect as well. All right, anybody else on um, helpful resources, additional books, anything along those lines? We got quite a few in the chat window, which will make sure to make a part of the posting as well. Um, and um, just, Guys, just real quick, I'm going to share my screen one last time and just bring up um, bring up the final, uh, let's see, the final thing that we wanted to address. And it's not letting me move. Come on. There we go. All right, there we go. So the final um, screen that I wanted to share with you tonight, or this morning rather, is um, again, we had the... Um, we have the HCC uh, or Howard County Schools technical access link, um, as well as the Howard County Schools help link. Um, we had questions come in from parents regarding how do I get a laptop? We're still having some questions along those lines, as well as internet access for Howard County, which is where our church um, sits in Howard County. You see the technology link there, as well as if there's just overall help that you would like to have. Um, uh, again, this is a great resource. I went in there and I saw quite a few answers um, to help parents and students during this time of dealing with online learning and online school. So definitely take advantage of that. And um, we'll make sure to add to this slide all the links that you guys are dropping into the chat window so that it will be a part of our ongoing um, availability um, as far as the uh, the taping that's going on right now with the session and also the information that was shared. And then um, to those of you who will be watching this later today or later um, during the course of the weeks, um, please give us feedback on this Zoom community forum. We have a, um, an email address and phone number where you can give us some feedback uh, different days and times, um, as well as ideas for ongoing community forums. One of the ones that we're looking at doing is one on finances in January, given um, some of the things that um, our social worker, Janae White, spoke to regarding um, uh, the impacts to family, families' finances because of COVID-19 this year. Um, again, there could be some financial help, helpful tips that will be offered relative to taxes, planning, 
um, and recuperation from that, as well as just ongoing um, financial planning for yourself or for your family. So we're looking into that for January. And um, does anyone else have any final questions or any final comments that they'd like to make before we close out with prayer? And we're again, just thank you to our panelists, our wonderful panelists for all that they shared with us. This tape is awesome. I mean, the information gained is just golden and we can't thank you enough. Pastor Allen, any comments? I just want to say thank you for all of them and their time and their, um, their heart for their students. You can see that love for each and every one of you as you explain. And, and, you know, you light up like a Christmas tree when you talk about students and their learning. And, and you can always tell those kind of gifts in folks when they're younger. And, uh, and then as they progress into adulthood and get their education and training for the, the, the occupation that they go for. So thank you for that. I wish that I had that. I do suffer from ADHD. So I have to do um, little projects at a time until they go to completion. So you have to keep like six of them in your mind and the, the process of all six because you kind of get bored and you move, say, oh, if I do that, I, I realize I have to move to the next one. And so I didn't have all the resources that you guys are providing. So you just have to learn that on the fly, I guess, as an adult. And I, try, I didn't want to take a, a medication for it. So later in life. So but thank you again for all coming and you giving up your time today and your family. Thank you, family, for being able to come. And I, we're just going to pray for you all as you all, um, as we close out, so that you all will be able to endure and have the wisdom, the grace, and clarity as you put forth information and teaching your students. Go one, ahead, Pam. One more quick point. When the, when the recording is ready, we will get that link out to you guys so that you can also make it available to, um, to anyone who may need this kind of helpful information. I mean, I was just taking notes like crazy, but this is, this is awesome. Thank you so much. Pastor? All right, thank you all again. And so we'll, let's close in prayer and, um, and uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll close out. Father, we just wanna thank you once again for the opportunity that we can gather together to learn about our students, to learn about the culture, and learn about our, our teaching community. We're thankful for these teachers and admins and um, administrators who have come to, to share with us um, about all the things that we can do for our students. And I pray that you would give us all wisdom to, to know what, what, what each situation is with our students and our, and our children so that we can you know, assess them, let it, let it not be all on our, our, our teaching community, but uh, the parents do have a responsibility as well. Lord, if our kids have any signs or symptoms, we'll keep them home so that we won't avoid, uh, uh, we will avoid having our schools to be shut down. Thank you for the, the task that seems um, like an elephant and you have to eat it one bite at a time. And I'm thank you, thankful for them and their patience and their kindness and compassion towards students and parents who need help. And uh, we all need that help a lot. So we're thankful for that and ask that you would strengthen them, that you would lead them and guide them as they go through their days. Help them not to lose heart or grow weary. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I'm on mute. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You Thank too. You. Thank you.